All right, so our next presentation, recreating a disk record from an image will be given by Don Wilson. Don is an inventor and proprietor of Wilson Materials. Previous experience includes careers in information technology and organic chemistry. Publications include several papers and articles on removing contaminants from biodiesel made from degraded greases. His work in recorded sound includes developing technologies to recreate new physical copies of rare disk records, novel methods to shape sapphire stylus, and creating an electronic cylinder record player using off-the-shelf components. Welcome, Don. Thank you, Rebecca. And uh, thank you, everybody who is attending. Uh, this is going to be a very uh, technically dense and fast-paced presentation. And I very much look forward to sharing it with you. So let's get started. We already know that there's uh, several technologies that are uh, that have existed for some time that are able to take a physical disk or the uh, the image of a disk and uh, to extract the audio of it uh, by using the waveform that's visible inside the groove. Uh, these technologies are entirely digital, have been around a long time, and uh, at this point, uh, most of the people listening to this presentation are already familiar with them. Um, however, uh, after uh, learning about them, uh, ironically, at uh, my first stars presentation uh, with a great conversation with Patrick Feaster, uh, I started thinking, well, why not make a physical copy of the disk from the image? Surely that must be possible. So uh, with 20 some years working in information technology, um, implementing various technologies that are fashionable at the moment, uh, whatever management happens to throw at me, then followed by uh, several years of working in organic chemistry, specifically in biofuels, um, that combined with experience in well, anything that I could get my hands on, as well as the scientific equipment to be able to measure it, I was more than happy to experiment with uh, that ranged from uh, jewelry making and glass, uh, working with materials such as Teflon and stainless steel, uh, and then later um, computer-aided design and 3D printing. I just love to know how things work and then to make the things that I want. Uh, here are a few examples. Um, these are all uh, things that I've created uh, specifically for recorded sound. Uh, on the left, we have a copy of a, a rare Berliner um, mother, as they call it, uh, which was generously loaned by John Levin so that it could be duplicated. In the, middle, in the middle is the uh, electronic cylinder phonograph I recently developed. And on the right uh, shows the results of a uh, microscopic saw blade that I developed, which is able to cut very precise shapes into uh, hard materials like sapphire. So here we can see a saddle stylus uh, that I had carved for playing 78 RPM metal parts like stampers. Um, there are several disc records which exist only on paper, and these are the ones that very deeply intrigued me. Um, they were either uh, photographed, um, or more commonly, the uh, Emil Berliner had given several disc records after he invented it, uh, so that they could be inked like a pressing plate and pressed into paper. And this technology was very mature in the 1880s and they were able to press them uh, into paper with uh, great precision, so much so that the waveform is fully visible. And um, this is going to jump around a little between history and uh, photochemicals, uh, but this is a very important piece of information that uh, really started me down this rabbit hole and um, introduces a man that's virtually unknown. Um, his name is Max Levy. Max Levy is the reason why Emil Berliner had set up a Philadelphia location. And he was also very important uh, for the technologies that were developed to mass produce disc records. 
uh, Levy was on the cutting edge of lithographic technologies in the 1880s and the 1890s. Um, this piece of information came to me uh, just uh, in passing uh, during a phone conversation with Oliver Berliner. Uh, of course, Oliver is Emile's uh, grandson. Uh, while researching this, I found that um, Emil Berliner mentions Levy in his 1895 Franklin Institute article. And um, he cited him as being someone who was of great help in the mass production technologies. Uh, according to Oliver, this work was so important that it earned him 250 shares of Berliner's company's preferred stock. And uh, that's in comparison to 50 shares that were given to Eldridge Johnson, uh, who you may know was responsible for uh, developing Berliner's uh, spring-driven uh, phonograph or gramophone. Okay, so here's the um, where we start to get into the technical parts. Uh, lithography, quite literally, um, is Latin for writing with stone. The way this was done was by taking some sort of a greasy pencil, like a crayon, and uh, drawing the image onto the stone. Now, this waxier, greasy um, material on the stone would protect it, uh, would help it resist acid uh, as uh, acid is applied to the stone, washing out the areas surrounding um, those that have been drawn on. With these areas washed out, we now have a relief which can be inked and paper pressed onto the stone, leaving the same image. As time goes on, uh, this system uh, becomes much more mature when uh, photochemistry starts to become uh, better understood in the mid 1800s. Uh, this became um, the, the first of these chemicals to be developed is um, gum chromate, as it's often called, or it's a mixture of gelatin. Uh, yes, that, <laughs> that gelatin, the type that uh, is still sold in grocery stores, along with uh, some sort of a uh, chromium salt, such as potassium dichromate. Um, this material is still used today for making printing plates. Um, it becomes uh, very hard when the dried material is exposed to light. The unexposed areas remain water soluble, making it ideal uh, for making things such as printing plates. And it's also capable of very high resolution. And in essence, uh, here's the process. This was a plate that I made to put on the back of a disc that I was creating. Uh, to the left, we see a plate that has been sensitized with a, uh, with a more common blue film. Uh, it's then covered with a piece of uh, transparent, um, uh, the same type of transparency used for overhead projectors that had the text I wanted printed on it. And after a few minutes of exposing it to intense light, you can see on the right that the, uh, the blue film has washed out uh, where it was not exposed. So we're going to go back in history one more time. And this goes to one very specific recording. Uh, and Emil Berliner was familiar with all of these technologies, uh, the, the gum chromates and the photochemistry that was happening at the time. And he recorded a disc, which is known as uh, Schaldruck. And uh, this disc was an experiment where uh, he describes that he's going to have this disc um, used to make an intaglio print. An intaglio print is the opposite of the type of stamp that you might be used to seeing in an office environment where the, the raised areas uh, press ink onto the paper. Uh, an intaglio is uh, exactly the opposite. The ink becomes uh, stuck inside the recessed areas and uh, that leaves marks on the paper where there are uh, depressions in the um, uh, in the uh, the stamp, shall we say? Um, Emil Berliner had these pressed in the paper, and uh, I'm quite confident that that paper was then placed over sensitized plates, and he tried to recreate a record. Uh, and 
he would have had all of the uh, lithographers that he had access to in Hanover, Germany, uh, attempt to do this, as he describes in his recording, uh, but it was unsuccessful, uh, but we don't have information as to why. Uh, however, in the course of recreating this technology, uh, the, the reason why becomes very clear. Uh, here we can see uh, this is an image of one of those paper prints, and you can see that it's full of imperfections. There are little white darts that stick down into the black areas. There are uh, black areas that extend into the white, and then there are just uh, breaks in the lines altogether, uh, all of which would have been reproduced in a sensitized plate, therefore making a record that would sound exactly as awful as you might think it would. And that's saying something for the standards of the 1880s. The photomechanical process was later named uh, graphic arts. That's where uh, the term graphic arts uh, comes from was originally the photomechanical technologies, but by the 1890s, they started using the term graphic arts. Uh, a lot of this information is very hard to find because it was mostly trade secret, but uh, when one digs really, really hard, eventually uh, it is out there. As seen uh, in the previous image of the, uh, the blue plate that I showed, a, uh, a photo mask is all that's need to selectively harden an emulsion. And uh, a picture from a camera can do exactly that. When it comes to using films for lithography, they're quite a bit different than uh, the films used for uh, taking a picture in a camera. And the way that they're different is because they are capable of extremely fine detail. And that's because of the, uh, the size of the particles of silver that's inside the film. That's what gives it its ISO rating. A typical camera film might have ISO 100, which will allow a photograph to be taken in a hundredth of a second. Whereas ISO 3 will give incredibly fine detail, but will take an exposure of 30 seconds with very intense light. Developing the film is also different. Whereas uh, a normal uh, black and white photography um, chemistry will give uh, a series of um, an endless variety of shades of gray, lithographic developers, uh, they give only solid black, were completely clear. Now, something people have asked about frequently is um, why not just use a 3D printer or some other modern type of technology? And I made this image just to give a quick illustration as to why. From uh, left to right, that would be uh, the X axis for uh, such machinery. Uh, the, um, that's where the carriage is moving. It's moving uh, forward and back and left to right. And uh, those uh, mechanical motions uh, are always visible after uh, using it to recreate uh, some sort of a disc recording. And with uh, accuracy of only uh, at best uh, one thousandth of an inch, uh, that becomes very problematic when recreating grooves that are up to uh, four or five thousandths of an inch wide. And I can't say that modern print technology is any better. Uh, here on the left, we see uh, an image taken from uh, the cover of some glossy magazine. Uh, industry standard is around 300 DPI. Anything uh, above uh, 600 DPI is generally considered unusual in, um, in industrial printing, even for you know, uh, big name glossy magazines. So the ruler at the bottom shows 500 microns or half a millimeter. And to the right, uh, I have an image uh, using uh, such lithographic technologies, which also has a ruler 500 microns long, half a millimeter. And you can see uh, exceptionally fine detail has been recreated, which is uh, simply not possible using modern printers. And uh, here we can see uh, that this is uh, the first glimpse into uh, using such a photochemical process. To the left is the sole surviving image of the Schaldruck uh, experiment. 
Uh, this is in Emil Berliner's papers held by the Library of Congress. And to the right is uh, a, an experimental uh, negative that I had made of it. Well, what about using um, digital scanning technology? Uh, digital scanning technology is still very new. Uh, it may not feel that way, considering the advances in digital technologies, but it is. It's only in the past 10 or 15 years that uh, the CMOS sensors that are most common in digital cameras uh, have achieved the same level of resolution as a 35 millimeter camera. And uh, that's simply not even in the ballpark for being able to recreate a disc record. It would take many, many, many of these images and then taking a tremendous amount of time to stitch them together. Meanwhile, film uh, has been in constant development uh, since the mid 1800s. And it's only limited in resolution uh, by the grain size or the size of the actual silver molecules that are inside the emulsion. Um, I've, I've not ex uh, done experiments with them, but there are reports that uh, platinum emulsions can uh, achieve incredibly high resolution. Uh, but regardless of uh, what shortcomings only silver may have, a 10 by 10, uh, the standard size of a 78 RPM record, such a photographic negative would probably be somewhere around two gigapixels. And I think that anybody would agree that trying to do that with a single digital image uh, at this current stage of technology is simply not possible. So how does one take a big picture? 10 by 10 inch film or bigger? Uh, they do so with one of these. This is called a process camera. Uh, it is an enormous camera, half the size of a average car, uh, weighing about 500 pounds. And these were the standard for creating any sort of print media uh, all the way up into the digital era. Uh, this one is from the late 60s, and it is a Goodkin Astro camera, which will accommodate sheet film up to approximately 20 by 30 inch. Uh, you'll see on the back plane that is um, in the uh, horizontal position that uh, that back plane is where the film would lay. And uh, the sheets of film that it accommodates are so large, they need to be held in place by a vacuum source. And that vacuum source uh, will keep the film perfectly flat while the, uh, what's being imaged is also being held perfectly flat by a glass plate, making uh, absolutely perfect alignment. And uh, here was one day's test of uh, negatives hanging up to dry. Now for some results. You'll see in the bottom right that there is a microscope calibration slide. And that calibration slide is, it's a ruler. And the ruler is one millimeter long. And it's graduated in uh, each, uh, each line on it is a hundredth of a millimeter or 10 microns long. Uh, this is some text that I added to some of the work that I had done recently simply to see how small can I really make these details? Using this technology, I recreated uh, three disks at present, uh, three disks that do not exist as physical ones. And here are two of them. The one on the left is from a German publication and this disk is uh, generally known as Han Shu. And on the right is uh, an early five inch Berliner that was an experimental recording that is uh, generally known as Zalin as the name is across the top. And uh, Zalin is nicely dated December 14th, 1889. The third disc that had previously only existed his paper uh, is uh, the Schaudruck recording. And this was the first that I recreated uh, this was uh, an early copy that I made on the left, and it is sitting next to uh, the image that I created it from, which uh, again, at the Library of Congress, 
And here they are side by side. So you can see uh, the fine level of detail with which it was recreated. So much so that even at several hundred times magnification, the disks are identical. The, um, the recording is of course from 1890, 1889 uh, as the bottom of the disc states. So the, uh, the fidelity is low, has is, has is expected for that era. And uh, hopefully I enabled sound when I uh, started this meeting. And let's see if we can hear just a little clip of it. That was a Mule Berliner counting in English from one to 20. And uh, now that this disc has been photochemically recreated, uh, it is now the earliest playable uh, disc record in the world and also contains the earliest uh, singing in German. Just for a little bragging. <laughs> Uh, there's my part of the name in the previous slide being shown at only one millimeter. And here you can see the actual grooves that were recreated. This is detail being recreated that is um, 50 to 100 microns crossed. And you can see that the, the waveform is fully present. The negatives are much higher resolution than the actual etchings. And here's some images of those. Uh, these are uh, in, incredibly detailed, uh, so much so that comparing them to the paper um, very much so is identical. Uh, there is some texture that's gained when etching it into a physical material, uh, but the, the negatives are absolutely incredible with the resolution that they're able to achieve under the right conditions. Um, this is technology that I've pushed quite hard, um, being able to recreate uh, a disc with a groove width of only 20 microns, making it significantly smaller than even a microgroove record. And the fidelity of that recording uh, was respectable. Uh, but this has been done with fairly rudimentary equipment that I've been able to find by buying an entire lithography studio off of Craigslist and various other uh, industrial and uh, uh, chemistry related goods that I've been able to find and cobble together. Uh, but this is technology that I feel is really worth pursuing further. And there are some next steps. Uh, and most of those are related to better equipment, better equipment for the use of better materials. Uh, here is shown a, a product advertisement for a microprocessor grade uh, photochemical that's called SU8. And SU8 is a very old one. There's much higher resolution materials, uh, materials with resolution uh, that is on the molecular level, uh, but they require incredibly precise light sources and meters that I simply don't have access to. There's also the possibility that since the, uh, the dose of ultraviolet light that hits the material uh, creates the, uh, the depth of um, the, um, uh, the material hardening, uh, that it's possible that this might be able to be used uh, to recreate vertically cut media, since at the more narrow parts of a vertic vertically cut groove are going to receive less radiation. And uh, I have seen some evidence of this uh, in the laterally cut media that I've experimented with. So there's a link below that I, I will also uh, paste into uh, the chat window so people can uh, check it out. This is uh, one of the uh, early, uh, one of the early etchings of Shaldrup that I've done. I um, digitized it both as a uh, raw transfer directly from the disc as well as a slightly cleaned up version. Uh, this one being an early experimental one, uh, 
I accidentally etched it backwards. So those of you who download the, uh, the, the raw output, uh, please take that into consideration. There's also high definition uh, video of it under microscope, uh, as well as a, uh, an image of the original paper pressing itself. And I included all, this, uh, all of this information to make it very clear of what I've created and uh, to give good detail to see um, that uh, this is a technology that I'm very pleased with. And I would like there to be no ambiguity uh, as to exactly what it's capable of. Uh, so I, if you're interested, I hope that you'll download these uh, images and uh, audio clips to have a listen for yourself and then compare them to uh, the other audio extractions that were made of uh, Shaldruk. Uh, for more information, I hope you'll see my website, Wilson Materials. I have some uh, fun projects that I'm usually working on. Um, a uh, fun, educational, and somewhat silly YouTube channel and also uh, my cell phone number and email address are below uh, if anybody has any questions or comments that they would like to share directly with me. I certainly hope that you will. And uh, with that, uh, I would like to thank um, the uh, ARSC uh, management for putting the effort into making this conference happen for everybody who's watched this and of course uh, to Rebecca for moderating. Thank you. Thank you, Don. That was fascinating. Um, and it's really amazing you were able to recreate those records in such detail. Um, I'm glad you were able to get some bragging in there. Very well deserved. Um, while we are waiting for some questions to be entered into the Q&A section, you did receive some congratulations in the chat um, and marvelous work. Well deserved. Um, I was wondering if um, you've managed to do any sort of comparative analysis of the recordings you were able to capture through your experiments versus um, perhaps a recording recreated from an optical scan itself. There are um, so at present I've only recreated uh, three discs. And um, the one that's been studied the most has been uh, the Sheldrick recording, since it's the earliest of them. Um, I, I've listened uh, to the, uh, uh, the restored transfer that uh, Patrick Feaster had made. And um, it's important to mention that uh, I'm not an audio engineer. So when it comes to using software to clean up a recording, that's something that I'm just not good at. Uh, so I don't think that it's a very fair comparison since Patrick is much better, but having made that disclaimer, I think that the raw transfer of um, my disc is on par with Patrick's cleaned up version. That's interesting. I wonder if you would be willing to clean up your raw transfer to get a more comparable head-to-head uh, -head. <laughs> Analysis. I, uh, I have sent out many copies of the Shaldruk disc, and I suspect that within the coming months, uh, we will see that some very talented uh, people will be putting out uh, their uh, cleaned up transfers of it that were probably also made with things like the right size stylus. Right. Well, that's really exciting. I look forward to seeing what happens with that. Thank you. Um, all right, we're not not seeing anything in the q and A. I I think everyone is stunned speechless. Um, I can't believe Mike Beal hasn't asked anything yet. Come on, Mike. We'll, we'll give him a moment to type. <laughs> um, you did receive a comment from Mark Atnip, Don Wilson, music's mad scientist. Thanks so much, Don. Thanks, um, Mark. You have a mind blown comment. So yeah, I think. <laughs> Everyone is just wowed. Um, but thank you so much for this. This was so interesting. And uh, I, I feel like I learned a lot. So thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Rebecca.